lot of casting is who do I what, who do I believe this person is when I turn the camera on and then they haven't said a word? Like, what am I getting from them? Their essence, their energy, just the vibe that I get when they walk in the room. Like, so much of casting is that, and that's not really something that you can change or train away like that just is who that just that's who you are as a human being walking on the planet and so i think the first step is really understanding who that is and 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 what roles need that type of person and so um having materials that really showcase you as being able to be that type of person Let's do this. All right, we are recording. Seth Kasky, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me all the way from, from LA. Absolutely. Thank you so much for extending the invitation. I'm really happy to be here chatting with you today. My pleasure. That was the most formal kind of part of the conversation <laughs> done and out of the way. We can get past it. Um, yes. I, I always start this now. It seems like a go-to thing with everybody, the whole like, how have you been during lockdown, COVID, this weird time, for humans, weird time for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, what's it kind of like being for you, I suppose, in both those regards, sort of professionally and, and personally? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I think it's the biggest thing is this has certainly gone on a lot longer than I think really uh, I personally anticipated. You know, our last day in the office was March 13th and we thought, oh, this is going to be, we're going to be down for a month or two, two months. months or like we thought, you know, it, this was going to resolve itself relatively quickly and to see sort of how it's continued and that. Um, it feels like that whole world war, the whole the world over by Christmas kind of thing, you know? Like yeah. They, they kind of told the, the guys that back in the first, was it first or second? First world war, wasn't it? That whole world over by Christmas and then like years. And years, years later. Yeah. I mean, I think there is, there is value and benefit to sort of having that thing that you're looking forward to, or like feeling like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and I do feel like, you know, the world and, and we are sort of moving through this and growing and learning and the industry is changing. And, and I, you know, some of the things that have, that have been put in place now that production can get back to work, I think are smart things and good things. And I'm, I, I, I love innovation and, you know, working hard. And I love that, that we've sort of, okay, this is the situation. This is the hand we've been dealt. Now we have to figure out how to do what we do within those constraints. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, yes, to say that it's, I like to put, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of positive thinking and, and, and trying to, to find the silver lining or trying to find the good in whatever is happening. That does get exhausting sometimes. So yes, it's been a very trying number of months, just the weight of everything that's been, you know, the pandemic, the, um, you know, we're in the middle of a, a very contentious election in our country, you know, no. the... <laughs> oh, what? another one, uh, another, oh, yeah, man, I'm very ready for November to the coming up. I mean, I'm just very, for it to be done. I'm ready for it to be done. Just either way, just so we know what we're dealing with, at least. I mean, I, I certainly have a preference on which way. It obviously, goes. <laughs> obviously. But it's like uh, sometimes the sort of lead up to it can be worse in terms of just yeah. the anticipation. And it's just this constant anxiety. Like that's what my wife and I were talking last night. Like we spend, by the end of the day, you're just exhausted because you spend so much energy consuming news. And we, we try to be fairly good about limiting our consumption of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and the news and, and trying to sort of not be on the phone all day, but you spend all day in this heightened sense of anxiety or this heightened sense of energy. By the end of the night, you're just like wiped out and exhausted. And it just yeah. to have, have being do that, doing that for so many months, it just, it, it can get tiring. Hey, did you watch that um, documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma? Have you heard I, of that? I have heard of it. Um, I started it and I got maybe three or four minutes into it and realized it was going to be super anxiety inducing. And so I was like, I just, I don't think I'm at a place that I can really consume this. I, I was, I was going to say, it's like yeah. kind of what you were just saying has a lot of through lines with what they talk about there. And the whole idea of what you were saying, being mindful of consumption mm -hmm. of media on take your pick of the platforms, I guess. Um, but just the way it's set up and designed from a 
psychological mm -hmm. understanding of the human brain evolutionarily perspective to get people addicted to that hit and just the and way the algorithms that it's so, so able to personalize what sure. it does feed to you is sure. yeah yeah i think there's great things and really frightening things and yeah. it's sort of that in the wrong hands and it's that whole thing of oh, well if i'm seeing this then everybody else is seeing this surely mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's complete bullshit that's mm -hmm. that's the scary part so that's what I was kind of alluding to with the whole thing of just let it be over in November either way. Cause I like, you don't know what people in some other part of the country are seeing on their, on their feeds, even though right. you know this, this happens. It's, you can't stop it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's super interesting. You know, I, li I live on the West coast and, and uh, most of my family lives on the East coast and right. we just sort of have everybody's different. Everybody has their different opinions, but you do sort of see, how people's worldview is shaped by what the the culture and the, the environment they're in and what they are consuming and sort of like I'll have conversations with members of my family about stuff that is fairly well known to me and things that have been talked about that they are completely either have not heard of or have heard a completely different spin on it it's that it's just yeah from a yeah, from it, a from a film and entertainment perspective, let's try and bring this on topic. Yes, <laughs> let me let me bring Great. this on topic. Cool. This isn't my political podcast, which I should never be allowed to have. Um, <laughs> do you do you obviously like Netflix, Amazon, and all these platforms do tailor in a similar sort of way mm. your content based on what mm -hmm. you consumed? Which I don't know if I see that as a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know yet in terms of how to label it, but. From a creator's perspective, do you think that that maybe opens the door to more independent filmmakers, potential showrunners to, okay, you might not be getting the millions and millions of views of, of an audience base that some of these super shows do, but do you think it's an opportunity to create little sort of like niche audiences for people? I, that's the exact word I was going to use. I think that is, that is, is certainly what makes streaming a, a valuable, you know, you can go down a rabbit. Hole. Yes, you, you are. I think the goal is to have that, you know, blockbuster that that appeals to a mass number of people and, and millions of people and millions of dollars and, and all of that. But there are so many niches that that you can that you can find a very valuable revenue stream in a very small segment of people that are going to watch your show and yes you're exactly right like I'll, my wife and i we both have netflix accounts or we have the same accounts and this you click back and forth between the two and we both watch very different things and we're both getting suggested very different things but then we we will get sort of you know if it's a new comedy we both like comedy so there's a if there's a new comedy special or there's a new something that we both that we both watch that will pop up there and then we tend to to gravitate towards that but yes i i do think that from a creator standpoint there's an opportunity for um a, a lot more specific content and, you know, and, 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 and one of the things that I've noticed specifically with Netflix is, you know, they're really bringing in a lot more international mm. content, you know, because it's it, it, those, all those streaming services are global companies. It's not like CBS and ABC or, or BBC, you know, it's the, the, that are sort of more isolated to the countries in which they operate, you know, Netflix and, they're global. And so they have audiences in those countries and then, you know, content creators in those countries that then we're able to consume as well, which I think it just sort of adds to what's out there for people to, to watch. And then if one of those breaks out, all of a sudden people are aware of, you know, this totally different style of, of, of creation, I guess. The only one that comes to mind immediately to me is like Money Heist, the Spanish mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which which was made by a local TV station originally in Spain. And then I think Netflix eventually picked it up, but it was a good while after it was just sort of aired terrestrially. Mm -hmm. And then the Netflix phenomenon taking it global. Yeah. Now everybody seems to know these actors and maybe they're more tapped into Spanish content creation, mm -hmm. which having grown up in Spain, going back 10, 15 years, Spanish TV is garbage, like was garbage. <laughs> so to then see this kind of stuff come mm -hmm. out is actually an amazing shift for what I would call less traditional countries for, for that. 
And I think what it does is, is it kind of to your point of the Netflix phenomenon of it takes these shows that may have had a, a far smaller, smaller audience in the country that they were made and just opens that door for them to be consumed by so many more people. And I can't help but think that's a good thing. I think so. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm in my head now thinking people are going to tune in and go, talk about casting. <laughs> I'm an, act, I'm an actor. I don't, just, why have you got a casting person on, Ashley, if you're not going to talk about casting? So um, it'll be remiss of me to not talk about what you do professionally. I guess sure. before we do, um, I always kind of do like to ask the question of what's your, what's your origin story, I suppose, of getting into the world of casting. If I'm not mistaken, you were, you were an actor and then kind of moved into casting, which isn't that sort of rare. Um, you don't act anymore at all. It's casting completely for you now, I guess. I don't. It's, it's really funny. Some people have asked me if I would do it again. And, and there was a time in our office where we were casting this procedural and um, the other casting associate that was working on the project, she's like, there's this role. We, we're having a hard time finding it. You'd be great. We just come in and read for it. I'm like, sure. I still have my SAG card. So yes, I started out as an actor, um, was here for a number of years, got my SAG card, booked a, a couple of projects, did what I felt like I needed to do to sort of satisfy that internally. Um, but she asked me to come in and read for it and I walked in the room, the camera was there. I mean, this is somebody I work with all the time. There was no reason for me to be nervous. And I got so anxious and nervous in my head. I was like, nah, I'm good. I just, it's not for me anymore. I think that, that I sort of reached a point that I had sort of scratched that itch, you know, that I, that I did what I felt like I, I wanted to do in terms of of acting and I didn't need to do it anymore. Mm. And I think casting is what I was supposed to be doing the whole time. Okay. It just, I needed to sort of take that journey of understanding the actor to be able to make me a, what I feel like is a mm. very empathetic understanding casting person. You know, I, I, I moved to LA in 2006 to, to start that journey for me. I, I was training at the time, like I said, got my SAG card and sort of as a part of that process, um, started interning in casting offices. Uh, I sort of met some casting directors. They uh, were gracious enough to let me come in and sometimes be a reader in their office. This was back in the days of fax machines. I was faxing sides to agents and sort of getting to see the creative process from that side. And I was sort of looking at it at the time as this is a way for me to Connect and get escalate. it. Escalate. Well, connect to them and then also to de-escalate the nerves so sure. that when I went in as, you know, when I was going in for the audition, I understood what was happening in the room on that side of it. So I didn't take anything, any sort of nervous energy or, or stuff moving around or people talking like it wasn't about me. Like it was like they had a whole life to do and they just needed to see these 12 people in this hour and move on to the next thing in their day. And this is like what, 06, um, when information was available, but maybe not quite as en masse as it is perhaps totally. now. Yeah, I mean, there, there was, it was, there was moving to doing a lot more business online, but it was still a lot of calling, you know, dropping off physical headshots and bringing those to auditions. Nice. And, and a lot, of, a lot of business between casting and agents was done on the phone and setting up sessions was done sort of very um, analog, writing it down on, you know, in pencil on a schedule and erasing it yeah. and people around. Whereas today it's, it's, 99% computerized and everything is done um, online. Um, and, and really just sort of connected with that process. Like I'm a problem solver, like that's, that's kind of, you know, I, I, did a little, I did a little research on you too and I know that you sort of have a business management background. And I think that sort of, you're, you're creative but you're also sort of an analytical thinker and I think I, I very much am the same. Um, and so I love that kind of problem solver team building, like understanding systems and sort of getting the right people in the right places. Like that's energizing to me. Um, and I started to really connect with that part of it. Um, Cause you are yeah. the puzzle, you are putting together that puzzle within casting. You know, I guess when you get the brief through as an actor, we might look at it and just go, well, I'm coming in to read for this role. And that's the only thing that, that matters to me, but to you, it's this huge tapestry of how mm -hmm. you can weave it all together and solve this big, big Rubik's cube, I guess, to the best of your ability. Yeah, you're really, you're really painting a picture, uh, you know, and it's, 
and what I have found out and what I always like to remind actors is that casting is one voice in that artistic painting. You know, you have your creators, you have your writers, you have the studio, you have the network, you have everyone who has an opinion about what color should go where and how, you know, what, what shade of purple we should use over here. Um, and so our job is to really kind of bring now I've gone on this art metaphor that I don't know that I can continue. It's there. You can, you can. bring, <laughs> is, bring is the to right. really bring those the, the right the right paints and the right options to the table. That then that sort of allows the creative team to 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 put together the right ensemble. You know, because yeah. it is. It's not just you as an actor that's going in on one role. Feel like I, I'm going in to fill this one piece. But how does that one piece fit into the the whole picture? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's frustrating, it's challenging, but it's also the exciting part of the job because sometimes it's that color or that one person that you were not expecting to be the thing that glues it all together. And that's always fun when you find that, that missing piece. And I guess from an actor's perspective as well, you know, we always just look at it as we can do everything and we'll mm -hmm. audition for everything. And why, why, why couldn't I go up for this and then that next week, which is, is you know, I suppose, true but maybe not realistic from a pragmatic looking at it as a business perspective and so you spoke about using the right kind of kind of uh, paints or colors i suppose from an actor side it's important to know you know what what, what your you, color what, is what your color yeah what what's yeah. your color like yeah. what kind of palette do you offer and then what offices and what producers and directors or networks do you maybe fit more in the wheelhouse of as mm -hmm. opposed to trying to spaghetti sling everyone all over town mm -hmm. just because you act and because they cast you know like yes i think it i think that that's very important for actors to sort of understand the product it is that they're selling and i think that that you know there's a spectrum. I don't think any actor is only one thing and can only play one thing. I think an actor can make a career playing that one thing if that's what they want to do and they sort of want to specialize as well, that. Let, then, let, let's yeah. caveat it if we can, Seth, as sort of actors that are maybe in the sort of co-star, guest star era or maybe don't even have credits yet where mm -hmm. you almost don't quite have that canvas to to go out and, and pick and choose. And so instead of trying to do a zillion things, just honing in for a while and showing, you know, this is what I do and I do it well, you know, Jim Carrey doing comedy and Ace Ventura and Dumb and Dumber, Tom Cruise being Tom Cruise until he eventually could sort of shift. Um, more for those people than say series regs or more established actors. Yeah, I think if, if you're just starting out or you've got a few credits, then yes, really understanding, you know, a, a lot of casting is who do I, what, who do I believe this person is when I turn the camera on and they haven't said a word? Like, what am I getting from them, their essence, their energy, just the vibe that I get when they walk in the room? Like, so much of casting is that. And that's not really something that you can change or train away like that just is who you that's just that's who you are as a human being walking on the planet and so i think the first step is really understanding who that is and 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 what roles need that type of person and so um having materials that really showcase you as being able to be that type of person um and whether that's um student films or things that you produce on your own. I, I always encourage actors that are like, I don't have anything. I don't have, I haven't gotten my first co-star yet. Go out and shoot something, shoot a scene, make a web series, do something creative, create your own content. Show me how to use you. You know, that's, I, I watch a lot of, of demo of, of new actors. Cause that, that's, you know, when you're, when you're a casting associate on a show um, and, and when you're in series on a show, a lot of the parts that you're putting on each week, especially on a show like Glow, are these one and two line co-star parts. There's a strong appetite from producers and, and the team to see new faces. They don't wanna see the, you know, especially on Glow, like they didn't really want anybody on that show that looked like they were on TV. They wanted real faces and real people and, and interesting actors. And so going out and finding those people, and some of those people were just out of school or ha didn't really have a, a, a ton of credits. and so 
I really use demo to sort of get a sense of who you are as an actor and who you are as a performer and understanding how I can use you. If not on this project, then okay, I get, a, I get an idea of sort of your essence and vibe where you might fit in a project down the road. There's so many things you said in that. that I know I talk I think, a lot, I'm sorry. No, 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 in a good way. No, no, yeah. <laughs> There's so many things you said, Seth, for God's sake, man. No, that, that are so like important and so many important through lines for actors to hear. I think one big one was what you said about, you know, you're watching something now, but you're not just thinking about the project here and now. And for an actor, that's incredibly reassuring to know that, okay, it's not really about booking the, it's that corny thing of don't book the job, book the office, but it sort and of that is. is a hundred. That is not corny. That is the absolute truth. I yeah. cannot tell you the number of times I have had actors that have come in and they weren't right for the part, but it's like, that's a good actor. I don't know where I'm going to use her, but she's fantastic. And then two shows later, or, you know, on a, a pilot, some other time, it's like, Oh, remember, remember she came in for us, the, the, you know, and it's, and it's, I go back and I bring in those people that I love and, and, you know, our office is, it, we, we do, we have sort of the list of actors that kind of are always on our list of people to check and look at when we get a new project. It's the people that we love, that we know that are gonna do a good job, that we know are professional, that we know are training, that we know that can handle it. It's like, those are the people we go to first before we start. If it, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are those, are those people that you've sort of normally cast and work with often, or are those just good actors that you like and you've seen a bunch of times and you want them in the mix? Yes. And yes, oh, yes, and yes, yes, and and people that like in when I had an office. Sadly, I'm just at my home now, um, but we even still had a, a stack of of headshots. Those our office is a little old school on some things, and so sure. we will always take a headshot if an actor brings it into the room. And we had a whole stack of headshots um, in one of the cubbies on my in my office that I would go through and be like, people that I want to remember that oh, we have this role coming up in GLOW, let's look through this thing first and see if there's three or four people in here we can try before we put out a breakdown and, and bring in the masses, people that we know we like and we know we wanna give the opportunity. And so, which is awesome. And now I'm just putting my sh sort of feet in the shoes of any actors listening who would go, great. Now, Seth, how would we get on your radar if we're not already on your radar to possibly hopefully one day be one of the headshots in that in that mix what kind of things make up that for you and how could they do it sure uh, i mean one of the one of the nice things is uh, our office did at the beginning of this quarantine time we did a, a a big open call where we asked for for actors to send in you know one or two minute monologues or scenes oh, yeah. and we got 17 nearly seventeen thousand of them that i'm I think, still I think going i might have been one of those actually i actually think i might have been <laughs> you might have been you yeah. might have been we're 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 we're, we're processing through those so it's it and we're kind of you know filing people away Seventeen thousand. You know, yes yes you call yes. you 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 asked for it it's, it was, you know, this was back in the in the early days of quarantine, yeah, yeah. and I thought this was just going to be around for a while, and this seemed like a fun project to do. And it's been we amazing. Honestly thought, we see. honestly thought it was going to be like a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred people, maybe. Like nobody's, who cares? Nobody, none of us. We only put it out on Instagram. None of us really had a ton of followers. We were like, we'll get some. And we'll look at it. It'll be a good, fun project for us to do. Keep ah, because then agents started then, getting word. Yes, I think my yep. agent said to me, yep. check this out. And I think mm -hmm. people wanted something creative to do. Like people yeah. were just losing their shit. And even if you don't watch them, event, you know, it might take a long time to watch them. So just the fact that you did it gave people something in that time to latch onto. Yeah. Yeah. And I am watching them. That's what, the, so if anyone's watching that did submit, I am, or someone in our office is watching them and we are, we are processing through everything. Cause I, I do think that's important. We did ask actors to do this and I like to be respectful of your time and energy that you put into doing it. The least I can do is give you two minutes of my time to For sure. watch what you've put together. It just takes longer than you thought when it's 17,000 <laughs> submissions. Well, yeah. I just, it, I, just What's the, the volume average of number of submissions you would get for like a regular co-star or, or guest star? It was that bad. You just bailed. No. You got my DSLR um, 
Can you hear me now? I, uh, you're all good. I could hear you before. Okay. Uh, yes, it, I, it has a timer that it times out after 15 minutes and gotcha. the, the, the it's a mirrored camera. Yeah, yeah. So I just have to refocus it um, to get it to stay alive. Yeah, so on, on average, 17,000 sort of submissions for this as an open thing must be infinitely higher than a regular co-star or guest star, which I know could probably get into mm -hmm. the thousands, but mm -hmm. for, for a regular role, what do you, what would you normally be looking at if you opened it up? Yeah. I mean, for a regular, you know, for a, a guest star, you're looking in the fifth. I mean, it, it, it does depend on sort of sure. how specific the breakdown is. The more open, open ethnicity, wider the age range, it's going to, that's going to increase the number of submissions up to, I mean, I'd say probably 2,000, 2,500 is sort of the, for a guest star, um, you know, or as small as several hundred. I mean, I would say several hundred is pretty typical up to a couple of thousand. Um, and then, you know, when you start getting into, for co-stars, it's I would say it's in the multiple hundreds, you know, between a uh, hundred and a thousand that's kind of where it is because you know there's there are a lot of actors who are looking for that first co-star and then there are a lot of actors that are wanting to move away from no longer people. willing to do a co-star so it, it you know it, it is sort of that uh but either way we're not we're talking quite a lot of people oh yeah really. yeah 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 so because this comes up all the time and it'd be Sort of great to get your view on how you specifically in your office sort of operates through it. It's that terrible question of what kind of draws you then to a specific person in those submissions. And I know it's so intangible because you're drawn to something one time it might be the headshot and the other time it might be the demo reel. But are there any through lines that you can give there or is it too ambiguous? I mean, I, I do definitely think having, you know, Having a good headshot and good picture that really shows me who you are is sort of, I guess, would be the one, the one consistent piece, no matter what the project, no matter what the role is, is really having a good, because that's my first, that's my first thing to click on. And then I'm going to look at your resume, then I'm going to look at your demo. But I think the thing I, I, I like to remind actors and sort of, let me, let me, let me break it down to you for you. So we get a script we sit down with our with our creative team we come up you know we write a breakdown we talk to them about prototypes who are some wait what's up if you could cast anybody in this part who would it be or what are you thinking creatively from this for this part for this episode and then so we sort of look at the submissions through that lens of this is kind of what I'm looking for. I might be left or right of that type or that energy or that essence, but I'm kind of in this general block. Yes, occasionally, you know, our, our theme in our office is three things you asked for, one thing you didn't. So we always do try and bring that like, this is not at all what you asked for, but this is a really fun, cool actor that we like, that we want you to meet that we think could be interesting that might get the part. So we always, we always do sort of go outside of that sort of window. But I would say like, if, if, if here's my window, I'm sort of applying that filter to my submissions as I go through. I'm like, who looks like they might fit in here and, and having a good picture that really shows me, okay, yeah, I, I buy that person as the HR person of a hospital. Yep, they, they, they feel administrative to me. And then drilling down to, if I know them, then, oh yes, they're fantastic. I love them. We should surely try them. If I don't know them, then looking at their demo, if they don't have good demo, okay, let's look at their resume. Are they, you know, fresh out of school? Are they training? Right. It, it's, it's just sort of understanding them as a, prof you know, where they are in their career path. I have a big appetite for new people. Like that's, that's because I, I I was one at one time. And so I, I understand I have very fond memories of the casting director who gave me my very first co-star job. So I, I get there's an actor out there who's doing all the right things or doing all the things that they can to, to get themselves ready to work. I love being able to sort of find that person and give them the opportunity to book the job. Um, but yeah, if there's one through line, I think it's, it, it, it's that picture that really represents you demo that really shows me what you 
what you do, you know, that's part, if I don't know you, it's, I want to see you saying words on screen and like what, it, because so much of casting is the, what I get, what's the vibe, what do they feel like on camera? And in a time like now stuff, when people probably can't proactively go out and shoot stuff or make their own thing to maybe a super high production level, does it matter if it's not necessarily incredibly pristine production level no right as long as nope i mean uh, yes exactly i mean it's a self-tape at home or it's you know i, I think that it, it, it exactly it's performance and it is um really just the opera a, a good tape that you are proud of that really feel that you feel like this showcases what i do as an actor and what i bring to the table and then just like a resume once you get better footage then get rid of that one. Like it's there to use until you don't need it anymore. I think, yeah, totally with you. I think there's that thing of like with a startup business, you kind of want it perfect before you launch, but then you'll never launch. So I think there is that opportunity to get in your own head as an actor and go, oh, but this doesn't look like a, this doesn't look like something to the production level of Glow. I could never send it to the people that cast Glow because they won't think that I'm serious. And it's not about how it looks necessarily. It's more about the essence and the vibe, especially now when COVID. Happened. Exactly, exactly. When, when, when opportunities are limited for, for people to be out shooting new things. I like to think of it as, gosh, see, this is where it's funny. Like all of my jobs have sort of led me, all the like, random jobs that I've had in my life have led me to this job, which is why I, why I say casting was what I was meant to do the whole time. So for a time I worked, um, for an innovation studio at a university. And part of the innovation process is ideation and you prototype. And it's like, you prototype the thing that you think it's not ever, you prototype, okay, we find out, well, this piece doesn't work on this or, or the shape of this is different. Okay, so we change that. So I think, think of think of your demo. I'm getting chills talking about that. That's cool, I, that's a good. Is that a first? It's a first for me for like make for like for those pieces exactly. falling together. Yeah, it's 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 ideation. It's prototyping until yes, like at some point you're going to get to a finished product that's manufactured and is out for the public and it's going to be that perfect polish piece. Like you have your 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 two sort of films that you have that are done that are are, are beautiful and highly produced and well acted and you know it's 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 amazing to look at. But I bet you went through some rehearsal and some sort of ideation phase and in, in getting that together. Which is if that's what you is that if that's what you have at, right now? You have to start. You just have to. Yeah, start. you just have to start. Thank you. First of all, I suppose I should definitely say thank you for for that. And then yes, just starting. You know, I think yeah. for, for for me it was just a case of pick up a camera. Who do you know? Make something. It's not going to be great, and then refine as you go along. Mm -hmm. And then keep pushing yourself and growing, and go from a short film to a short film that isn't funded by you, that's funded by someone else, mm -hmm. a bigger project. And, you know, I don't think that ideation necessarily stops. It just goes to another level where you try and add on new bells and whistles, you know? And yeah. And you, and you start bringing in more people to that. And that's where, you know, the creative collaboration comes in is it is other people. Oh, well we have, you know, you have a, a, a solid kernel of an idea and then you have, you bring in a casting team that's able to, to even find, have, you know, we read the script and we have some ideas of, of ways that it can go. And then you bring in production designers, you bring in costume, you know, wardrobe and costumes. And, you know, it, 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 it it's a collaboration. Yeah, I it's mean, totally it's, a collaboration. It's the whole, you know, faster alone, but further together. And I think mm -hmm. times where you need both because, you know, you'll have to put your head down and just be you in your zone doing your thing. And the same with production and actors have to go and then, you know, prepare. But ultimately, that only takes you so far. And then it's when the whole thing comes together that you can get to the level of, you know, mm -hmm. things you've done with Glow. Otherwise, Glow would just be an idea in someone's office somewhere mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without the whole team. I love how we're talking about this from a slightly more business entrepreneurial perspective, just because no one's spoken about it in that kind of implicit way before. But I do personally at least believe that that is the truth of it um because i don't like saying the whole we're the product as an actor because it just sounds this but it, there is truth to it but i do think that if we saw stuff more from the entrepreneurial perspective 
it kind of makes it easier to compartmentalize what we're doing as creatives. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I mean, entrepreneurs and startups to me are the, the most equivalent and similar thing to an artist with the uncertainty and the amount of investment you have to put into it until you get any returns. It can be a long time. You need to bring in other people to be part of your team. The parallels to me are so sort of implicit and yet you're the first person to start talking about it in these kinds of words and talking about like ideation, which sounds very MVP entrepreneurial. And I, and I think that it's it, 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 to, to make it maybe sound more creative. I think sure. it's that idea um, that comes from writing of, of kill your darlings or murder your darlings or whatever that is, you know, mm -hmm. where it's, where it's because what, what actors do is so personal. It, there is a, I, I do feel like it, it's hard for actors to pick their own pictures or to edit their own demo because they're so emotionally and personally connected to everything to the craft. Right. And, 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 it, and it's a personal decision or it feels personal. And I think there, there is value in not removing it to make it only business and making it cold, but there is value into being able to objectively look at, look at the art and look at, and look at what, what it is that you do bring to the table. Cause everyone brings something unique to the table. And that's Casting works when the right role finds the right actor at the right time. And it's, and it's just understanding where you, who you are and what you bring to the moment. And it might be your moment on this project, but there's going to be a moment at some point. I don't know. If that yeah, makes sense. It, no, it does. I, I mean, I totally get you because you can pull your hair out thinking, when's it going to be my time? When's it going to be my chance? And, and as long as I guess you're allowing yourself to show that essence and showing up for the work, the right thing will come to you at the right time. I guess the big challenge, and I know it's something that I had and, and, and I think most actors probably do at some point is allowing yourself to fully let that side of you be seen, which is the work. But to your point about anxiety and coming in the room, which I think all of us have in some capacity and the nerves come there and we get in our head about a gazillion things of, you know, thinking we have the job before we have it or getting stressed out because of what it is or whatever it might be. I don't know the answer to how we can get to a place where we can sit in a way that's more relaxed and comfortable with that to just come in and enjoy owning the work for what it is in the space or in the digital sphere, I guess now. But you obviously see people a lot more than I do. So from a casting side, have you seen any kind of patterns, any kind of things that you could maybe share as words of wisdom to actors in terms of how to try and navigate getting to that space? Cause that's the, that's the golden kind of land, really, you know? I think it's going to be, it's going to be a personal for every actor. Um, but I think... It's a tough question. A, a finding, a, finding, a, no, I mean, I know how to answer it because it, it, it's the truth of it is. It, it, I'll give you, the, the, I'll give you the, the sound bite first and then we'll sort of unpack it. Sure. Realize that you booked the job by the fact that I'm requesting you to self tape or, or I'm giving you an appointment to come in or, or I'm zooming with you to in this age, the job is yours. You don't, all you have to do, come in and do is do your thing. You've already done all the work to get me to notice you, to, 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 to bring you in and think that you're right for this particular job. You have the job. And I think it's, it, 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 it when a person is able to approach an audition from that mindset of I'm just here to do the work, take it or leave it. Like this is, this is what I have to bring in this moment. Great. And they don't, they don't need it for their insurance or need it because they are a fan of the show and want to be on the show so bad or want to impress me as a casting person. Like if they can just come in and do the thing that, and, and from a standpoint of you got the job, 
I hired you for this five minutes that you're in my room. You're not getting paid for it, but I hired you because there are 2,500 other people that I chose not to hire for mm. this moment. And so it's, you, you got in the door. Just <laughs> accept that you, accept that, that, that the job is yours for now. If this moves forward and you get paid for it later, amazing back to our point that we were making earlier, but just come in and do it. And even if you don't book this job, you have made an impression on us that we go, she's not right for this, but she's a good actor. She can handle herself under pressure. We'll remember her for something down the line. Yeah. And I think that, that it, the, the, and that is so much easier said than done. I that, that that's the thing. There's no, it's like you said, it's personal for everyone in their journey not as an actor or an artist, just as a person on this weird earth that we're all living on right now to at some point get to that stage in their life. And I don't know, I don't know if you can even manufacture that necessarily. You know, I think it's just something to to process and be mindful of and, and whatever, whatever trigger it is, whatever we're wording or framing, like you're the, that's the first time someone said it quite the way you have in terms of, you know, you've already, got the job it is your job when you come in and have the audition and if that it's enough for one person to go and take away and make them feel relaxed then that wording's great because it works for them for someone else maybe it's a different mantra or something but i guess everyone has to find <sighs> kinder self-talk i suppose yeah and 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 an understanding of I know that that casting can also often be seen as sort of the gatekeeper of the people that are my you know, favorite the people keeping you out. You know, we're the we're the we're the center are at the gate keeping people out, but that's yep. not that's we're letting people in. And it's like I want you to be the one that gets in and gets the job. One because maybe you've been auditioning for me for years and I'm so excited for this to be the thing that you book. Two I've got 26 parts that I've got to do in two weeks. Please just be the person that, that <laughs> is the part that I can just, I can don't have to worry about this role anymore. Yeah. Like I want, casting wants you to be the answer. We want you to do good. We want you to, we want you there. Like that, that is the one, like I want you in my session. I gave you a spot in my session. I want you, I want you there. And yes, there, and that's and that's where back to when I was interning in casting offices, understanding that there's a whole life that's happening in that office that you're walking into that has absolutely nothing to do with you. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that's good practice too for being on set. And it's one of the reasons why I, as a as an actor, decided I I couldn't. I got very good at getting the job and I got very good at auditioning. I realized I didn't really like being on set because to me that that was another level of pressure of hundreds of people and thousands of dollars and all of this, like it was depending on me and I could, I sort of crumbled underneath that pressure. But now I have the perspective of going, none of that had anything to do with me. All I had to do that day was come in and say my lines, hit my mark and go home. And that's all you have to do in audition is just come in and do the thing and not allow yeah whatever might be around it, you to affect stories. you because it doesn't have to do anything it doesn't have to do with you we've built up all these stories about what it's supposed to mean it's i'm going to do a product placement have you read this book have you read sapiens by yuval noah harari i have not i've not but, but you i've know the, heard you of know it the book yes i do know of it i don't get any affiliate commissions by doing that by <laughs> the way that's just putting that disclaimer out um but but he, he talks obviously loads about stories and, and the way that as societies, uh, we just build these different narratives up. And, and, you know, from the case of an actor to what you just said, that's the perfect point of how we do that within our profession. We create these stories in our head about the audition or the job or being on set that we feel like these narratives are so personal because it is us as the product mm -hmm. that, we believe them implicitly. And then when something doesn't play out the way we think it should, the story is so strong that, again, that self-talk is really cruel. You know, like, you, I think it's amazing you're talking about when we get an audition, that is the job and we've got the job. My concern if I go into the deep, dark recesses of my mind would be, you could let yourself trick yourself by thinking, 
oh, but he wants me to get the job and he just said he wants me to get the job. But then if he's called me in and I've not got the job, I must have done something wrong. And maybe I'm, you know what I mean? It's the imposter syndrome that can kick sure. in. And all these stories that are just complete bullshit are, are the bigger challenge in some ways than learning how to be a good screen actor. Yeah. Because, 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 you know, to your point earlier, the, the job of the actor is to let their truth is to let themselves be seen. And you have to, I mean, that is, that is the job too. Like you have to, to use someone else's words in another, in a, uh, an imaginary situation and allow yourself to be completely vulnerable and open and truthful in that moment to let the camera see all of that. And you have to, in the work, you have to step outside your own Ashley story, Seth's own Seth story in that moment and be this character in this moment living truthfully. So using an audition as an opportunity to practice that, maybe that's, maybe that's a good way to another good reframe. It. Just it's audition is your practice of being on set. You have the job now just practice doing the lines and yeah. think of it that way. Think of it as a rehearsal. Think of it as, you know, the actor that comes in that doesn't, I've heard it said this way and I don't like it, but the, the actors who don't need the job or who just are just, who just come in and do the, I know that sound, there's, there's, that's not quality. I know, what you, I know, they I know. They just come where in and do the thing. Like just, they just come in and say the words and go home. And it's like, they're a nice person. They did the, they did the lines, maybe it'll work. And then understanding that, you know, of the 2,500 people that were submitted, I brought in 30. My producers are going to see that these are made up numbers. Producers are going to see 10. They're going to pick four. The network is going to pick one. So the fact that anybody gets the job actually is amazing. <laughs> and there are so many steps in that process that the actor has no control over. Like the only, the, the only bit of um, input really that the actor has in the getting the job process is be on time, know your lines. Don't be weird in the audition. Like don't be weird in the audition. And then you have to walk away and then just trust the process that if it's, does that make sense? Because there's totally. so many oh, variables totally. and there's so many people that are like, I love this purple, but I really want more pink in this part. Can we add more pink? Well, she's really dark purple. I don't, I mean, I don't know that she's really going to be what you need then if you really want more pink. Yeah. The purple is fine. Purple is great. I love purple. There's totally a place for purple, just not in this particular painting. At and this time. I, I think just having more conversations and people being able to hear more of this kind of talk helps demystify part of the process a bit more so that actors can just sit a bit more at ease and go, okay, like Seth said this, and then they've heard other people say it. And all of a sudden it's not just one person's opinion on that's how it works. It's that's how it works. And having knowledge is empowering to then be able to come in and just, just do the work. Um, Yes, I get that that's also, as you said, easier said than done sometimes if you've got rent to pay and bills and like right. acting is is your only thing. Um, maybe it's an era where we have to have multiple, you know, strings to our bow and multiple income streams. I don't know. That, that's another conversation for another show, but. Yes, I'll say something. I told you I like to go on tangents, but, but to that point, I think the, and maybe that's another characteristic of the actor, those who have something else. You know, I, I can't tell you the number of times that that during that sort of brief chit chatty, either before or after uh, an actor comes in the room, especially if I know them, mm. like we will talk about anything but acting. Mm. Oh my gosh, talk about your dog or your, you know, or, or I saw your, I saw on Instagram you were doing this, or it's like someone who has, a life outside of just trying to get every job, I think is psychologically helpful for the person that they've, that they've not invested every bit of energy and time and thought into, because it, it's going to remove some of the importance and some of the. The pressure, I guess. That you yeah. Off, right? Yeah. It, if like, you know, if you focus, it's like, it's like if you focus on some, how much you don't have something, then you don't have it because you're focusing on how much you don't have it. Like if it, you it, self perpetuate just, that kind of eventuality, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that it's, it's, 
But I also think this is something Richard Hicks said this when he spoke to me and I hadn't heard it before and, I, and it, it kind of struck a chord with me. And I found that maybe I'd been guilty of it in the past too, where we have that strain of actor who like, obviously we know about the times when we really, 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 really want it. And it's so obvious and there's almost desperation seeping out of our pores. And we know that that's not great. But then there's the other kind of angle where sometimes we're told oh, well, just, you know, you'll get more chances to get the job when you don't give a fuck about the job. And when you don't care about it, that's normally when you book it, you know? Like, you know, when you go for that audition for Halloween Havoc 72 that you don't really want and you end up doing it because you weren't in your head? Well, that's what you got to try and fabricate. And he was like, yeah, but then you, you find yourself getting into a place where you play off that you don't, mm. don't care. And you sort of try and act like you're too cool for school and the point that he made that struck with me was that's, that's equally an avoidance tactic to committing to the work because you're just sort of artificially detaching. And, and I thought that was a very important point that no one had really brought up. And I thought uh, there's, a, there's these extremes. Somewhere there's a balance in the middle where I think it's got to be okay to care and want it. Otherwise, what are we doing? But it also has to be safe to go but when i know that it's to your point the kind of setup that it is i've got to be okay with not getting it because it's a crapshoot and i gotta live my life yeah i yeah. went on a tangent there too See? no but what i think that illustrates is just how i mean that's why i have so much that's why i'm glad that i had the journey as an actor and and, and our actor our, our office Liz Barnes, who I work with, her husband is an actor, Tana Stowley in our office. She's a former child actor. And so it's like, we get it. Like you guys have picked the hardest possible job to do, you know, because one, because of what we're, what you're asking of yourself to do emotionally and, and allowing yourself to sort of be emotionally available and vulnerable and present in, in these circumstances. And then you're also, you're, the job is auditioning and it's like you're going to not get many more roles than you actually get and to come back to that day after day year after year and say i'm going to continue to put myself out there to do that is it's admirable it's it is it's it's hard and it, it can be soul crushing and so f finding something that whether that is writing and shooting and, and making your own material, whether that is having a, a survival job or something else that you do that creatively does feed you or that can financially help you not go into every audition holding so tightly to the fact that I need this to pay my rent or I'm going to live in my car. Like it's you, tough. You got to build a life and not, put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that with a lot of things now with the pandemic, that it doesn't just apply to artists and actors necessarily, just with, with the way that the world has kind of shifted and evolved and, and mm -hmm. moved. And um, I don't really have a point with that, but it seems <laughs> like, but, but. No, but, yes. I mean, I think right now we are all in a, I mean, a, I think about I think about our office. We talked before we started recording, and the fact that um, just over the weekend we found out that you lost uh, Glow. Glow is not. Netflix has decided to cancel the fourth season order of Glow, and we had already started working on that project. Well, Liz and I don't have another gig right now. I mean, we're mm. wrapping up. The office is wrapping up um, a, a couple of small things. Um, one was a pilot that we were doing that shut down before the pandemic that they're coming back and sort of finishing up. Um, another is maybe a, it's not something I'm working on, but like now I'm in the, I'm in a position of, I don't have a job now. And, and what does, what does our industry look like going forward? How are we going to get back to work? What are we going to, we're all, we're all in this together. We're all, especially right now. I think that, that we're all on different, we all have different roles to play on a production anyway, but we're all now similarly trying to figure out what's next, what's next.
Yeah. And, and what do we do in the meantime? Yeah. And how do we keep ourselves, you know, that I'm, that's why I am so thankful that I have these, the, these open call tapes to watch. Like at least it's keeping me, I'm not doing it for any project or trying to find an actor for a role, but at least it keeps me watching, meeting new people, like just kind of working that muscle for me. Um, and I think that we're, we all have to find ways to, to stay engaged now, especially, but I think even in normal times, like finding a way to, you know, in LA, we really, we encourage actors to do plays. Like we have a lot of smaller theater companies that do, it, it's a time commitment. The theaters, you know, it, sure. it, it requires an investment of the actor, but it's just something to keep you feeling like you are moving forward. You're growing as an artist. You're, you're, you're still in the game. Yeah. You're not just on the audition circuit or waiting to, you yeah know? yeah because that's that's where it can be a little bit soul destroying because you don't really feel like you have a life outside of just hitting the circuit um from a creative perspective mm -hmm. but then yeah to your point what the hell is that going to look like you know we we're shifting into most likely full-on self-tapes and zoom auditions and and a a weird world that opens lots more opportunities up for people, but also loses that in-person, you know, this is great, but it's not quite the same as, you know, getting direction from somebody in the office and having that time to sort of adjust and play. And, and, and yeah, there's pros and cons to all of that, I guess. I, I really love the, the I, actually, I love the Zoom, the, where I can have this sort of interaction and I can work with an actor. I will say, here's another like idea that I had, you know, uh, that I think a way for actors to look at this process. Um, the job that you're asking for is for you to live truthfully in an imaginary circumstance, feel truthfully, let a piece of technology see that, transmit it over the airway, airways, and for me sitting wherever I'm sitting to feel something. Like that's the job. If you're especially if you're if you're if you're looking to to work in film and television, like you're looking to you're looking to work it's it's not like a theater experience where you're right there in the room with the person you're able to sort of the energy can pass between the audience and the actor like you're putting the actors putting their energy out into the world the camera is seeing it transmitting it to me and i'm supposed to feel something over here like that is what happens in a zoom like if you can get me to feel yeah. something in a zoom audition boom like look at these zoom things as great practice for the job that you want look at the self tapes as a great practice for the job that you ultimately want like, yes, it does feel disconnected, but yeah, so does working on set around all these people that yeah. shooting things out of order and it doesn't feel, it feels not real life at all, but that the end product is, I feel something on this end. Does that totally. make sense? Absolutely. I think we're just reframing stuff based on what we're doing now. And I'm not saying in-person auditions aren't right or wrong. It's not about that. It's just, that's what we've always done. Mm -hmm. But to your point, does that always have to be the best way? Maybe in some cases, yes. Maybe in other cases, perhaps not. But you're totally right. I mean, the end consumption of what we do performance-wise is for screen, going through a screen. So screen, it yeah. Kind of makes I, sense. I, I, I kind of don't hate it. I mean, yes, I, I do. I'm not a, you know, I don't love the self-taping process. And we sort of had our office had a policy of really using self tapes as a last resort. If you were, couldn't get in the room, like we would always much rather have the actor in the room. So I'm going to be much more of a fan of this. Cause I do feel like the self tape is, I kind of send my information out into a void. You send your take back into a void. We hope that they meet in the middle. If it doesn't, then I have to, I have to reach out to your reps and give notes. It's a very complicated yeah, it's a different communication skill set. process. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a different skill set for for both sides, and, and yeah. th there is no room for adjustment or redirecting. And I guess that's certainly not way. real time. Like that's why I like. But this, that's what you want to see, right? I mean, because that's an, ultimately what the director is going to want yes. to know if if that's being, you know, taken on board or not by the actor. That's key. Yep. So, a zoom gives us some inclination as to whether 
whether we can do that. Um, I, it's just new. And, you know, we're as mm-hmm. human. We don't like change as humans. You know, it's just, that's, that's all it is. I think as we're getting more used to it, we'll probably start to go, God, we should have done this a hell of a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. I mean, although I do like working from home or being at home, like, I mean, I haven't put on jeans in months. Like, <laughs> I do like kind of being in the comfort of my house. I will say that. Well, that's, you know, work-life balance too is an important yes. thing as well. Yes. So there's... There's, there's positives, there's silver linings to come out of all of this. Listen, I can see that I've got Scott here in the waiting room and he's probably been there for a while. Let me bring him in. Cool. I'm going to give you a break from me and uh, I'm sure he'll talk about Glow quite a bit. All right, let's do it. We were talking about it yesterday, so I, I've intentionally kept Glow quiet. Hello, what kind of background is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, know. I was like, welcome to my virtual office. I wasn't going to have it. Then I, when I loaded up Skype, it, um, Zoom, it was up. And I was it's like, there. this is hilarious. Let's just keep this on. Let's be it looks like you're at a startup company somewhere or something. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> with, your, with your head kind of melting into the background. I, know. I love yours. Though, Seth. It feels like you got some color in the background there. Oh, thank you. Yes, this is my home office. I brought home some fixtures from the office and, you know. It looks like it up nice. got, like uh, a black magic camera on you with some deep focus. Going. I said he's got a straight high <laughs> HD camera going. This is what we need for our project after that. <laughs> I know, I know, we do. We need some proper cameras and not just these onboard laptop cameras. web cameras. Yeah. 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 So I'm Scott. Nice to meet you. Thanks. For nice to meet you too. Yes. Good. Good. How's it going? How you doing? Hmm, that's a loaded question. Uh, question. Good. I've, I've really, in the last hour, I've had a lovely conversation with Ash and it's been great. And that's been, we've been having a, a really good time. Um, overall, I think pretty consistent with how most of the world is doing, like just trying to, to stay positive and make it through everything that we're going through and be supportive of, of, of everyone and take care of people that, as I can. So, yeah, for sure, man. I feel that. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I was uh, I was reading your bio that was really fun um, on your website, and uh, I was interested to know. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, what's on there? Okay. It's, it's actually a great. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of so I think you're okay if you've not looked at it all. It's pretty good. Okay. Um, and I know it's like I I didn't know that you used to be an actor and you got hooked mm. on casting. So mm. I just to know what was the hook? Like, what's the thing that makes you tick with it? What do you love about it? Um, gosh, there's so many, so many aspects of it. Ash and I sort of touched on this earlier, like I'm a problem solver. And so I, I, I love the sort of putting the pieces together of the casting process. I also love reading with actors. Like that is probably my favorite thing to do is it, because it still sort of scratches that itch for me of being, being able to play and act. I mean, I don't try and pull focus from an actor's audition in the, when they come in the room, but I do like to sort of give an actor as much as I can to help them get a good audition. Um, really the whole the whole process for me, you know, I, casting was kind of a, a, a way, I started interning to sort of a way as to market myself to casting directors. And just, I fell in love with the whole, the whole thing of getting a script and breaking it down and, and, and reading a script now, thinking about who makes sense here. You know, I'm, I'm the, when I first interviewed with Liz for the job, I told her I was a person, I watch TV with IMDb up on my phone as a person in the world, like not someone who's even in casting. Like I love figuring out who is this actor? Where have I seen them for? What have they done before? Oh my gosh, they're so interesting. Oh, I didn't even recognize them. Who are they with? Like that, it's the, it's the kind of understanding. I'm, I, I like to understand how things work. And I think casting sort of lets me understand how what I see on screen works and how all those pieces sort of fit together. Yeah, so it says like you watched stuff, you just wanted to decipher everything from what on screen back and like yeah. where did people come from. That's awesome, man. I love that. Uh, I used to work in casting way back, way back when in the UK for like a, a few, a couple of years. And uh, the room for me was really fun mm-hmm. behind and in front of the camera. I just loved that process, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, have you guys been uh, doing like, other than obviously receiving self tapes, but doing any zoom stuff and like with auditions and things like that as well uh we have pretty much been shut down since 
since right. pandemic started. I mean, we have had, um, you know, we are starting to come back a little bit. We have a, a pilot. Our office has a pilot that we were doing before we shut down that we're sort of coming back in to finish. And yes, right. we've been doing self tapes and Zoom. And then I, I'm not sure if you all use breakdown services in the UK yeah. or not, but they have oh. EcoCast, which is their sort of self taping service. FYI, uh, and just they've projecting Scots in LA. Just I just oh. 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 <laughs> uh, in my in my UK office. Scots <laughs> in LA in a UK <laughs> office. Sounding there we British. Go. Ah. Yeah. I'm in the UK, <laughs> sounding American. Well, and that was what I was going to ask you after we finished. I was like. Are you doing an accent now, or do you not have one? I was like, I was really expecting you to sound more well, British okay, than you we'll do. We'll get into that later. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> if you know a good psychiatrist, maybe they'll let me figure it out. Thank you. I'm in my way. Yeah, That's okay. funny. That's funny. Um, so Breakdowns has has come out with a, a a Zoom type product that we have have used a couple times. They're sort of still working out all of the the kinks in that, but yeah, we're we're figuring out different ways to to really make sure that we get the best auditions from actors i think that's the ultimate goal is whether it's a self-tape whether that's you know you work better as someone who goes off and does the material and sends it in or i personally and, and several in our office really prefer this interaction you know while it's not face to face and while i can't have you in the room at least it does i get a sense of your vibe and your energy in this in this exchange that I think helps inform an audition too. I think that's equally as important as as the work is this little bit of exchange that we get to have before or after you take. Nice. It's interesting as well because yet what you just touched on there with the Zoom stuff and like what doing the work through Zoom, there is if we're doing an acting class every week and there has been some kind of like weird connection with being able to do it digitally where it feels if you can get that authenticity, you can still feel stuff through how people are like, and you're like, it's, this is a screen, this is weird, but you can read it because the camera's still picking up a lot of stuff as it does on the film. So yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's the job. I and mean, we, we touched on this right before you, right before you joined, like that's the job actors are asking for is to make the person on the other end of, of, of that transmission feel something. And if you can do that in a zoom call, Boom. I mean, that's, that's it right there. I got to say that this is interesting because I've also, my experience with it and seeing my fellow colleagues and stuff have their experiences. I think there's like, there's some kind of uh, quicker confidence building uh, for actors uh, with using this medium from what I've experienced. And even part of me where I feel like I don't feel as pressured mm. uh, even the pressure could sometimes be really good. Sometimes it could be really bad, but then mm -hmm. it not being there sometimes with having this like access to it being, okay, I'm in my space. My dog's over there chilling out. I can have a good meal after this and you know, whatever ha Like there is something about turning up in your own space that can give you a uh, space to be like, cool, I, I got this a bit more than it does when you're in that smaller waiting room. And you need the next guys in the exact same role for you. And you're like, cool, mm -hmm. this is it, right? Who mm -hmm. signed the contract then, you know? There's something, um, there's some confidence building in it, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. I can totally see that, and feeling the comfortable in your room. And then also, like, kind of going back to something we talked about earlier that just hit me, I think there's also a a level of forgiveness or understanding on the side of casting or the side of producers or the side of the studio. It's like, we understand this isn't going to be perfect. Like there's a bit of like, this can be a little rougher mm -hmm. so that it, it frees the actor up to feel like it doesn't have to be perfect. Whereas when they're coming into the room, they have to, they have to feel like it has to be perfect. And they put all of that pressure and anxiety on themselves to make this the take. And it's like the thing. And it's like, yes, it still needs to be good. You still need to do your work. But yes, we're, if, if you glitch here or the audio isn't perfect or, 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 or the dog barks or something like that, the people, the people, the people receiving your audition are going to be more understanding of that. That sort of can alleviate some of that tension. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me when you're saying about the dog box and something, the best meme I think of 2020 has been you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, how many times has that happened? You know, yeah. you're on, you're on you're on mute. Mute. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know that's amazing man and uh just one thing this is more the, asking for a friend not really um mm -hmm. for your dog. Oh, <laughs> yeah my dog um O1 visas versus green cards for the old expats uh, when it comes to, obviously, when it comes to look, the network projects and the studio projects and all those kinds of things. Uh, I found that it's always kind of a bit of a gray area. And there's a lot of like talk of, yeah, you really need a green card and this and that to uh, even be let into the room versus having an O1 visa, which, you know, I know NBC have a thing about it. And I know that. I think Sony has a bit of a thing about it through their ex past experiences. But what's been your experience with, I don't know if you've met many on the O-1 visa that you've uh, wanted to work <laughs> with? In. I've had to get someone one and I've had to work with someone who had an expired one. And so um, I think when, when, I think the my biggest advice to an actor and their reps is be 100% honest from the beginning. If you need it, if you don't have it, if you have it, like if it's expiring, like that, that I think is what, because when we're looking, when we're looking at actors to hire an, an actor either on an O1, green card, in my experience, it hasn't mattered. Like that has been like the easiest one that like, everybody already has everything they need because there, there does get to a point where we sort of turn it over to business affairs and sort of let business affairs deal with all that. Like we deal with the creative, make sure that you can legally work here. And then they handle right. all of the legalese and the contracts and all of the paperwork that you need to be able to get paid. Yeah. So I, my knowledge of that process does sort of drop off at some point. Sure. Um, and from, from my experience, people with green cards, there never seems to be an issue once we sort of pass that on. Um, but with the visas, it, it's, and with actors who are on that, you know, SAG eligible, non-union, like just being as, as transparent as possible, because for casting, it's oftentimes we're moving at a very quick pace and, and eliminating, or just it, if there's going to be a roadblock, if there's going to be a stumble, if there's going to be a hurdle I have to get over, I need to know that before it hits me in the face. Because that, if it hits me in the face, and and I found out that it's something that I could have I could have avoided, or we could have backed up, you know, you're the choice, but we could have backed up somebody else that lives down the street, that's an, a U.S. citizen that we could have hired tomorrow, like, and I didn't back it up, or or I got my I got my creative really excited about that, that happened on a project we did. We got a creative really excited. We were told from the manager that this actor had an O1 visa got the creative really excited about it. They wanted to hire him. Oh, well, actually he's got all the paperwork and stuff in place to get one, but he just needs the thing. To, well, that's, and then it was, then we were two weeks out and then it was this mad scramble. We were the day before he was supposed to be on set. He had to f fly to Vancouver to leave the country and then to fly back in. Like there's all the things to like get him out and then back in on, he went out on the tour, back in on the O1. Like there, it was just this, and everyone was so stressed out and anxious and it was, we're all holding our breath until he got to set and it all worked out fine. It's ultimately, it was amazing. He did an amazing job. Like it was totally worth all of the hoops we had to jump through to do it. But the fact that we didn't know that we needed to left a taste in everyone's mouth. <laughs> totally understood. Yeah. yeah. No, just, yeah. yeah. Everything uh, in black and white from the beginning is the best. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and from, from the actor side, having all of that ready to go like you know if we do need to get you one making sure that 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 you have all of the, the the documents and paperwork ready to go and then if you have one that's expiring that that was the other thing we went into sort of handling handling your business to know that that's something that you need to have be on top of or, or you're having your manager sort of be on top of that with you so that you don't ever get to a place that it expires Got you. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was helpful or not, or very nice, but. <laughs> no, no, no. It's perfect. It's just good. No, luckily, I'm, I'm checking the boxes. I'm like, yep, that's fine. That's fine. That's good. Um, and so, fun, fun last question I have is uh, what is your future self 
uh, what really would love to uh, work on project wise if there's any if there's any if you could pick any type of show genre or even if it's something that is a, a franchise or anything like what's is there something that you're like burning to work on uh, I have said out loud in the office several times if I would sleep at the office to do anything Star Trek like that way like any of the any of, any of the, the the features or any of the new shows like that that was a show that was very especially uh next generation like i'm a sci-fi person like as a, as a person who likes to watch content like that's kind of what i have always gravitated towards so anything star trek would be my like i would do whatever i had to do to do that so you get on really well with my friend dana she's completely obsessed with star yeah. trek geeks out on it and it's her long life dream to be on the show so it i'll is, put you guys I, in touch at some point just to talk please <laughs> just to geek out, out about it, it. Yeah, just to kind of geek out on it because she'll love it yeah that's yeah. awesome but i'll never say no to anything i mean within reason <laughs> like i'm happy to talk to anyone but that's what we were telling us <laughs> before like we don't right now we don't have a, i don't have a job like we found out over the weekend that that glow was that netflix canceled the fourth season of glow and so yeah, that's sort so of good. Yeah. a bummer and you know disappointing um but so casting is like actors too like there comes a point where we just we don't have an endless supply of jobs we have to go out and, and get work too so i'm happy yeah. to to cast anything no, yeah understood <laughs> Good, man. Yeah. hopefully that all comes back around when we work it all out huh you know if there's got to be silver linings in it somewhere and that that show needs to come back it's Nominal. <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping that I mean, I, who knows whether somebody else will will take that on? You know, they they, they did they did know going into it that season four was going to be the last season, um, and so they had a lot of storyline to sort of. I, I don't know that it was ever going to like package up in a nice bow because I just don't think that's I don't think that's that show that everything is not completely resolved. But I would love for some of those characters arcs to finish a little bit and people to sort of see how they've grown and, and, and who those characters become. Um, and maybe we will, who knows? I hope we will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, look, this is, thank you. I've that's, that's, I'm, I'm done with questions. You're done? I'm done. I think I'm done. Let's get some more going. <laughs> How many hours we got in a day right what, now? We what's, in your, what's in your file of facts over there in your- Oh uh, uh, yeah, let me just- uh... in, in your, in your... <laughs> Uh, like your very ikea office you've got going on it's great it's great it's so dull isn't it this could uh, be a commercial there could be a com new the new commercial setup will be just zoom superimposed backgrounds and you just do it at it. home that's it i was thinking like i should set up like a tarantino backdrop of some kind. <laughs> and i was like i'm just gonna leave this because this is hilarious that's pretty funny that's pretty funny so scott you are you're here now for in the in the states Yes, yeah, I I, uh, I actually came in a couple of years ago. Okay. Uh, I had my O1 for three years, uh, just renewed, so we're good to go for another three years. Um, and yeah, I uh, I love it here. I love it. It's great. Um, I think I'm gonna try and go back and forth a little bit. The more that I sit a mull on it, I would still mm. like dip my toes in and out of both places and. I think after all this that we've gone through this year, I'm also like, I do need to kind of just see a lot of my friends and family back home as well as being mm -hmm. here too. So there's that whole thing. So my mind right now is like, right, can I juggle both things? But for the most part right now, I've been nothing but here for the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, I think it, it, this time has certainly helped put in perspective what is important. And I think that, that that's a, a great point that, you know, it's of seeing, family is important and and as long as there's streaming services and and tv and movie like production is going to continue like there, this is not going away it's going to come back a lot slower and there's going to be fewer for a while but this is never going to go away making sure that 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 you spend the time with those that you love is is super important too so yeah. I totally get that and also with zoom and all this stuff we don't have to necessarily be in town all the time to audition anymore so yep Yep. It's more just availability to work wherever the actual shoot is, um, or maybe callbacks if callbacks are going to be in person. If I don't even know. Um, so in some ways, again, it's another silver lining that you know Scott's allowed to travel. And yes. 
Scott, you well, that's what my wife and I were talking. You know, that we had talked about p taking a, all of our families on the East Coast, and we're like, we could just kind of go there for the rest of the year. Like, we could leave. I mean, even if I got a job, like I could still work from there because I'm not. It, it's highly unlikely I'm going to be going in to sessions and seeing people in person. I'm going to be doing this or self tape. So, yes, I think I think you're right. This does uh, afford us the ability to have a little more flexibility in our real life but that you know, we are available to be in the place we need to be when we need to be there. And the fact that you have an 01 means you can be here and work and it's not a problem. So that's, that's a great point. Oh, you frozen, Scott. That's fantastic. Uh -oh. Well, I was gonna evict you anyway <laughs> and wrap up the call. Oh. oh no, you're back. Yeah, you're back. No, you're not. Oh yes, you uh, are. Well, I'm gonna evict you anyway because it's just gonna happen again. Uh, all right. Unless you have any more final questions for Seth. No, no, no. I think uh, it's just been really lovely to speak to you. Uh, Likewise. Thanks for having me on, Ash. And, um, Always. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you digitally soon. Otherwise, Absolutely. Like, uh, in person at some point when we get past all this crazy All this stuff, but, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, man. But you take care. And, Absolutely. Uh, you too. Really, really nice to meet you. You too, man. You too. Bye, Ash, bud. Talk to you Thank soon. Thank you, Daisy. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I should have prefaced that because his weird office background didn't make it seem like he could get anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> I did interject. Like, no, the whole point was Scott is in LA. So I wanted to make it clear given that, you know, you are LA. So yes. I'm glad I'm glad we had that that chat. With the visa, quickly, I know because hmm. I know you're not a specialist and you're not an immigration lawyer or nothing, but my my one question would be around with people who do have the O one or don't, whatever the case may be. Um, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would only see people for a co-star or guest star if they had the documents already. Like, I doubt you're like yes. you're, for a co-star, yes. for a co-star, for sure, you're not going to go through all that process. So thank you for that distinction. So yes. So for a coast for anything in series, a series regular is the only person I would consider that we would consider that for but yes if anyone's coming in the room for a co-star or guest star ideally i would want them to have all of their immigration paperwork locked in place and they are a paid up sag member for stuff that we shoot because the likelihood of you having to be on set tomorrow or the day after tomorrow i don't have the time for you to sort of do all of that stuff i need to know that when i hire you you can legally work. go to set to work yep 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 but for the series reg that opens, that's the one time where you're more open to if the person's right and you really like the read and everything aligns somehow, time permitting, you guys are willing to work with the actor. And budget permitting and studio permitting. Like there, there is a lot of, I think, understanding and knowing that information up front lets us be able to shepherd that through the process. It's something that it, I can't get hit with that at the end. If I know before your the before my producers ever see a take that you've done he's in a, he's in the uk he doesn't currently have a visa blah or he's in australia he has an o1 like just understand and and that's always very important to us yep. what the immigration status is and where you physically are in the world like yes he can work here but he's actually currently in the uk right now okay that's because it, the production we travel like especially if you're testing like they're going to travel the actors in to test that's not something that we're going to ask the actors to to cover themselves so do we have budget to fly in someone from the uk and put them up for three days and it, it, are we in a position to do that yeah. um and the more we information it's just, it's just information it's information for us to have that that then our creative team can use to make decisions which basically falls on the actor to make sure the reps are informed and then the reps obviously translate that to you, but yes, the actor needs to be informed uh, or informed. Yeah. And it's, and it's my job to keep asking the questions. Sure. You know, I think that that's what we, <laughs> sure. I mean, that's what we sort of tell our assistants, like keep drilling down until you get the final answer. Well, why are they not available? What are they shooting? When are they shooting? What are the dates of that they're shooting? Are they, you know, just to kind of keep asking until you have a full picture of, of, of what's going on just so it's it's information it's not we're not, it's not a judgment on the actor it's not i don't really care 
I just need to know it so that that when the time comes to make a decision, everybody has everything that they need to know to make an informed decision. Yeah, totally agree. I think, yeah, I wanted to bring it up just because, as you can imagine, a lot of people that do tune in are are non-American actors, either Mm -hmm. British or, or some part of Europe. And the visa does come up quite often. And I think it's important to make it clear that, you know, series reg, you might help with that, but otherwise, no. Um, and, and also, I guess at this stage, it doesn't make sense to maybe even go for a visa and come out to LA or New York at the moment with the way that the market is, or would you disagree and say, if you really want to do it, still do it? That's a tough question. Uh, I mean, Again, my 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 experience I, I, my experience with the visa is 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 somewhat limited, but my understanding of it is is there's a the, the clock starts ticking, yep. like once you're approved and and you come into the states on that visa, like you have a, a finite window of time in which you can work. I would say 2019. You asked me this question. Yeah, come on. Like if you can get the visa and get the paperwork and you have a place to stay here, come on. Now I'm. I, I don't, I don't know that I can fully recommend that someone make that jump right now because yeah. while stuff, while there's a lot of pre-production that's coming back and there are shows that are going back into production, the volume of work, I think at this exact moment on October 6, 2020 is far less than it was a year ago. And are, do you want your clock to start now? Sure. Yeah. I think the best thing people can do if they want to do it is like you said before, get all their info together, get all the case stuff together, just there ready. And when the time feels like it's more appropriate, they've used this time to collate all of that stuff Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, And, and And, and to also work with your reps too. Like if your reps are saying, if you have an American manager who's saying, I, you need to be here. Like they, they feel like there's an opportunity for you you here because of relationships they have or connections that they have and projects that they know about that I don't know about, you know, stuff that's in development that having you here to get an international actor attached to like that, I think is just really being honest about it. And and just, it's, it's, conversation because i feel like most people are either going to have to come here on on no one that's sponsored by a management company or by a production so they're either going to have to have the job or with a management company that says we're willing to to sponsor you to do this so if if that's the case then just having those real honest conversations of what does the landscape look like for me right now and if through that discussion you both feel like it's a good smart career choice for you then that's a decision to make yeah absolutely Awesome. Um, Seth, I'm sure we could chat forever and ever and I've enjoyed it. I know um, I could because I talk I, a lot. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of slowly wrap it up with a few final questions and thoughts just to sure. let you actually have your day ahead of you and not eaten up by me. My, my sort of um, first one is obviously with you having been an actor and then made that transition now into casting, um, if you were to be able to go back and share what you've learned from the process of casting with your starter acting self, what kind of advice or, or sort of knowledge would you share with, you know, Seth who had a few acting Mm. jobs under his belt or none? It's not about you. Like that it's that, that I I think I understand. I I think I, I knew that intellectually always that, that, that the process was, there were many cooks in the kitchen and many, many factors to it. But I think even more so now, having having been on the side of getting, seeing the submissions, setting the sessions, reading the actors, going through it time after time after time after time, you know, episode after episode, that it, it's to, 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 to tie back into our, our, the point about not making the audition so important just understanding that it's you have the job like it's not about you like maybe you're going to get it maybe you're not there's this is this is such a business and a an industry that is so subjective and so collaborative that 
the fact that anything gets cast ever is a miracle. And, and when you don't get the job, it is not a reflection on your talent. It's not a reflection on you as a human being. It's not a reflection on the audition that you gave. It's, it's just part of the, it's just part of the thing. It's not about you. It's, it's about the 16 other people that weighed in on the auditions before they made a decision. Um, and to allow myself the freedom to accept that and to not, I mean, I, I spoke about it. Like I put so much pressure on me mm. to, to get the job that it's, that would be the biggest thing. And to have fun. My God, this is, if you're going to, if you're going to do this job, it's the hardest job in the world. Like don't have fun. You've got to have fun. You've got to enjoy and love what you're doing. And don't make yeah. it so serious all the time. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do the work, be on time, know your lines and Which, then have yeah. fun. If you're working in a bank or a corporate job, you need to be on time and yep. do your job. Do or, your job. Um, I think you're right. I, I think I love what you said about, you know, intellectualizing it because people I think intellectually do grasp that concept across the board, just like you said you did. It's giving yourself to your point that, that freedom and that permission to just really absorb that and, and find out for you, however you're wired as a person, which is different to, you know, the actor next to you, what that looks like. Um, Cause it's such a personal journey. We want the magic bullet. You know, we want the, we want the, if I do a, B and C, I'll get the promotion kind of formula, which just does not exist. It does not that you're in, then you're in the wrong, then you should go work for a bank. Like if that's, if that's sort of how you are expecting this business to work, you're, you're always going to be disappointed um, because it, it won't. Yeah, exactly. It, it just won't. And, it, and, and that's not a reflection on you for not having done the right things. It's just not how this business is structured to work. For real. Absolutely. Um, I always like to wrap these up with the 10 questions that uh, the great James Lipton used to ask on Inside the Actor's Studio. Okay. All right, all right. Um, and I'm definitely asking them now because of that reaction. So um, quick fire questions, just whatever comes to mind if you're up for it. Um, the first one is, what is your favorite word? Fuck. What is your least favorite word? Can't. What turns you on in a creative, spiritual, intellectual kind of way? Mm. Wow, that's a tough question. I think from uh, the stories I like, maybe that's kind of the creative stories that I'm, sure. I turn to. I'm an, I like underdog stories. I like people who have to fight to overcome something. And those are the, those are the stories and things that I sort of connect with. Cool. On the flip, what, what turns you off? That could be narratively or just something in life that really just doesn't resonate with you. It, it goes back to the word that I hate. Uh, can't. People who, 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 who give up, who, who don't try, who, who say that I can't do something. Um, I think that there's always a way to do, it may not look the way that you think that it's supposed to look, but you can always do something. Mm. You've already kind of answered this, but I'm going to ask it again anyway. What's your favorite curse word? Fuck. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite sound or noise? Oh, I, this, these stress me out because I feel like I want to have good answers for them and I know that I never did. <laughs> There's no um, good my favorite good. sound or noise. Um, I, I would live by the ocean and I think that, that the ocean, because it's a, it, it, it just is a very settling, like, reminder of the vastness of the world outside of me that is mm. that there's so much more I, i'm so small in comparison to the vastness of the universe so mm. the ocean what sound or noise do you hate the leaf blowers that are almost always on outside my house when i'm <laughs> trying to do one of these which i'm surprised doesn't come on today 
well, pandemic, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're being more sensible about how often. They oh do. my God. You would not believe like you, literally every day that I like how many people have yards that need leaf blowing right now. And they're every day. And there's also these really annoying ravens that sit in the palm trees outside of our house. They like call all day. That's, that's another sound. that I. Well, hate. that one we can let on because it's <laughs> nature. The leaf blower thing is slightly different. Um, what job or profession other than your own would you most want to attempt? Oh, that's a good one. Because I would have said casting like that with, um, um, maybe a teacher. Okay. Similar, similar kind of, you know, overlaps, I think in some mm -hmm. ways with, with casting, right? In terms of the traits. Yeah. And, and, and I really, um, and I sort of approach it from, I have a, I like, uh, it's not trite. I mean, I do sort of like the little like phrases. I have like some, some of those inspirational phrases and I really like the one, be the change you want to see in the world or be the person that you wished you had had as a kid. Mm. Like for me, that's, that's what, that's what, it, what draws me to that is, is, and then that's why I like having this conversation with you is I wish there had been a casting person 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that was just like, dude, it's not about you. Like they sort of gave me that very, uh, I understand where you are. Empathy. I understand how you get in your head and, and here's how you can sort of avoid some of the pitfalls that, that held yeah. me back. Um, that's what I, I like when I have the opportunity to be that for someone it, that I like, I like, I mean, that sounds selfish that I like feeling that way, but I like, I like helping other people navigate the thing that tripped me up. I, I can't see how it could be selfish if it's being of service to others. Um, granted, you might feel good by doing it, but <laughs> right. there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. There's right, no, right. It's, like, I'm not doing it to feel good. I just happen to feel good by it's like it. It reminds me of that Friends episode where they try and see if they can all do a selfless act or something. And mm -hmm. like Phoebe's just like, no, like everybody, when you do anything in whatever guys in life, inherently there's some innate reason that it makes you feel or desire or, or experience something that you want more of. But that game, I guess, is to do stuff that adds value to others and get that feeling too. And so, you know, you're, you're doing that with what you do now. That's what teaching would be as well. And, and I don't think that's selfish. Um, you know, selfish would be being like a banker who gets a payout after they've just screwed over the entire population. Right. Right. That's, that's selfish. Um, on that note, what job or profession would you never want to do under any circumstances? Uh, waiter, food service, working in a restaurant, they are the most, it's, it's something that I, I understand how hard that job is and how thankless that job is. It's not, not something that I've ever done. I just, I know that I would, I don't know that I could keep my cool a, as well as, as someone who in that profession. And it's just, I don't know that I would, I would be terrible at it. I would get fired very quickly especially in the States where it's so heavily based on tips. Mm -hmm. Like in Europe, they get a slightly healthier sort of base wage. Minimum wage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, final question, a little bit more ethereal, but just to kind of button this off, when it's all said and done, what would you like the story of your life to be? What kind of legacy would you like to have created? I, I don't want it to sound, I mean, I hope it doesn't sound trite, but like that I left it better than I found it in, in relationship wise, it, that it just, that I, that, 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 that all the time and energy that I've spent doing what I do here helped to make it better in some way and, and not, help make it better in some way that I, that I left it better than I found it. Absolutely not trite in any way. I think yeah. it's, uh, you know, and that kind of shines through having spoken to you for the last hour or so that, that, that is sort of implicitly a big part of just who you seem to come across as being as a person, forget casting and all the labels that we put onto, you know, what we do as as humans after just as, as a guy. Um, Seth, it's, it's been awesome. I've loved it. Final moment to you, I guess, just to button it off. Any closing remark that you want to leave people that are tuning in with to kind of, um, 
take away and then if they can connect with you on the socials or or anything like that where people can find you if they want to well if they've lasted this long because we've <laughs> gone on for a minute and then i applaud you for listening to me talk this long um i and i applaud you for the work that you're doing and the risk that you take by um choosing a career that is challenging is tough is thankless a lot of the times um and know that you have fans that you know i'm talking to you i'm talking now as a, as a casting person that i believe in you i want you to get the job i want you to be i want you to get everything that you want and casting does want to help actors get get that job move from a co-star to a guest star we're here for you we're your fans we love you hang in there keep trusting us we'll keep doing good work we'll keep looking for something for you until we find it um socials i'm on uh, instagram is my i'm on instagram and twitter it's both at seth kasky just my name all lowercase instagram is the one i'm a little more active on uh, and then if there's any actors that are watching that want to send me their materials um, you can visit my website which is sethkasky.com uh, and then there's a, a, a place there um, if you go to contact and then there's a, a section that's specifically for actors. Letting, tell me, you know, if, if you have reps, let me know who your reps are. If you want to send me links to your materials, your website, um, I kind of keep a, an internal database of, of actors that way. So that's a great way to digitally get me your postcard. That's kind of get me that stuff there and use that. And you can use that also to let me know of, you know, as, as we all start to get back to work, if you've got new stuff coming out or things that you want me to be aware of, that's a good place to, to let me know.